Good evening, everyone from the Vaticuti Foundation. Today we have a masterclass on uterine transplant, and our CEO, Dr. Mahindra Bandari, will introduce the program for us. At the outset, on behalf of the Vaticuti Foundation, I welcome our two esteemed guests, Dr. Puntember, Puntambekar, Sailesh doesn't need any introduction, at least to the people who would be attending this webinar. I have never met him personally. Um, it's my loss, but uh, I have heard for, I've been in touch with him directly or indirectly for years. He's one of the most accomplished, minimally invasive surgeon, cutting across specialties as I understand. And uh, he's equally good as skilled laparoscopy surgeon as well as robotic surgeon. And now I understand he's trying a new robot Another person, perhaps you know, is also a very, very accomplished uh, gynecological surgeon, robotic. And Ruma, I know for a very long time, perhaps during her training period. And uh, she is a senior uh, gynecological and robotic surgeon at the Apollo Hospital, Jubilee Hills, Chennai, uh, Jubilee Hills, Hyderabad. I have been interested from in assisted reproduction as a very small component of male infertility during my career as a urologist and keeping a track of how this field has grown from strength to strength. And since I have been associated with transplant, any, any kind of transplants uh, are come within my interest area. And when I was reading about initial work on uterine transplant from Israel and United States. I was thinking about it and I thought for a long time that it may be, it may be uh, at a stage uh, which is an incubator, but then I found out that Silesh had done uh, tremendous work in this area. I was hesitant to call him, so I called one of my buddies, Sanjay Kulkarni, to check whether Shailesh would be keen, and he very readily agreed. Everything was fixed up within five minutes through WhatsApp. Uh, Vatikuti Foundation uh, is sitting at the intersection of technology, surgeon education, and innovation. We are not in the field of creating new robots, but we are the interface between safe transfer of technology to the patients. We have done that for Da Vinci, we have done that for MECO, and that is what is our mandate. And we bring in these educational activities for the benefit of robotic surgeons and our community. And uh, Shailesh's talk is one of those. Without wasting too much of time, I'm myself very curious to listen to this exciting subject of uterine transplant, which is at the pinnacle of assisted reproduction. And handing over to our moderator for today, Ruma Sina. Thank you, Dr. Tambekar, for accepting our invitation and Ruma for sparing your time. Over to you. Thank you, sir, for introducing today's webinar for all of us. Um, good evening, Dr. Pan Tambekar. It's a pleasure to be with you today this evening. Uh, as Dr. Bandari said, Dr. Pandavikar actually requires no introduction to all of us. I have uh, followed him very closely with his uh, surgical career and have always looked up to him with all the kinds of minimally invasive work, including robotics that he does. Uh, but to be more formal, I just will share his introductory slide so that I do not miss any of the important aspects which I should have otherwise included. So Dr. Puntam Baker is uh, one of the most renowned minimal access surgeon from Pune. And of course, he has patented the Pune technique for radical robotic, uh, radical laparoscopic hysterectomy. And uh, today, as we are going to talk about the uterine transplant, he has been the pioneer in our country to do the first successful laparoscopic assisted reproductive uh, transplant. And subsequently, a baby girl was born to that female. Uh, at uh, Galaxy Care Multi-Specialty Hospital. I've also had a very close interaction with Neeta of, of this transplant and the subsequent delivery because she came for an oration for a conference which we had uh, organized, Dr. Pantemberger, in 2019. 
He is the only Indian to be on the board of AAGL. Uh, and also the faculty and member of AAGL Oncology Committee. We are very proud of you, and especially of the fact that you are now the International Secretary Treasurer. So uh, an Indian face in the board is really a, a, a matter of pride for all of us. He's operating faculty at Firecard and various international organizations. I'm sure we have all witnessed him doing a live workshop, either from here to AAGL uh, workshops or across the country. It is a pleasure, sir largest series of published transthoracic esophagectomy, both endoscopic and uh, robotic, known to perform, of course, he's established himself in performing most of the difficult laparoscopic and endoscopic surgery between his patients and colleagues at all area and being a surgical oncologist, definitely operating in all areas of oncology, thyroid, renal, GI, colorectal. He's pioneer in eccentration procedures, both anterior and posterior in both gynecological malignancies as well as in colorectal. And of course, awarded the prestigious Foundation Signature Award by AAGL. I'm sure he has been modest enough to write very few of his uh, awards. I'm sure he has a long list at the Golden Telescope Award, which is a very, very coveted award in AAGL uh, armamentarium, we know that. So Dr. Puntam Baker, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And I'm very, very keenly uh, waiting to hear from you uh, about the, your success story of your trine transplant. Over to you, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. At the outset, let me thank Dr. Bhandari uh, for this opportunity. It's an honor to be with the Vatikuti Foundation. And it's an honor to be introduced by Dr. Roma Sina, herself a very established and a very accomplished surgeon, though we have personally never met. Of course, I know everything from Neeta Verti, who is our common friend. And she was the person who told me that uh, you will be chairing this session. So I know about it. Thank you very much. And uh, in the next half an hour or so, so I will uh, try and uh, introduce you to the topic, which is very close to my heart and the reason and what are the efforts that went after doing this uterine transplant? So this is something which I was always keen on doing. I bring greetings from Pune. This is the uh, area where Dr. Shivaji Maharaj stayed. So a very, very iconic uh, Lal Mahal uh, uh, where Shivaji Maharaj said. So namaste from Pune, my city. We at Galaxy Care have always thrived for improvement and this is surely hard work. Sometimes the hard work also brings about some ideas which are enough crazy and the world thinks that they are crazy. And I always believe that uh, the success comes to people who not only think on the orthodox line, but sometimes who think out of the box. And this is what we did in 2017. And I don't know why, but I did it. And then I did it successfully. At the stroke of midnight on 18th of October, I think we had a little bit of liberation because we were fortunate to make our country very proud. We made history by delivering the first female child out of a transplanted uterus from the mother to a daughter. This was a promise delivered to this woman in 2016. And this promise came to her when she was introduced to me uh, by no longer no other person than Stefano Betocci, a renowned hysteroscopic surgeon who said that she has a Sherman syndrome. She has had three stillbirths and she's never going to become mother through her own womb. This is the time when we were thinking on the lines of transplant, but I didn't know whether what, there would be any light at the end of the tunnel. But out of the blue, in the moment of weakness, I said, okay, I will make sure that you become a mother. And therefore, on, when she delivered a female child, it was a promise which was delivered on. So meet India's first baby born. We have two more of them becoming pregnant now. And India's first transplant woman, her name is Radha, because before we named her, this was the 12th baby born in the world. 11 babies were named by the surgeons who actually delivered them. So we thought, why not keep the trend and named her Radha rather than Vincent or any of the names which we know about. So Radha is the first one in Asia Pacific and the 12th baby to be born out of uterine transplant. The question is, was this success achieved overnight? But no, we had to overcome a lot of hurdles and struggle. Some were easy, some were extremely hard. We had to collect a team of 16 doctors, 16 private practitioners right from 2015. And it's not easy when you do not even know whether you will succeed. So this is a group of 16 surgeons. The photograph was taken after the first uterine transplant at 11 o'clock in the midnight. 
after 10 hours of non-stop work and everybody seemed to be happy. So our team consisted of a chief operating surgeon, which was me, vascular surgeon, plastic surgeon, gynecologist, high-risk obstetricians, and of course, uh, various other people like IVF specialists, neonatologists. For two years, we used to have a meeting from eight o'clock to nine o'clock in the morning, discuss everything that we knew about, discuss the risks, discuss what were the hurdles, until we were ready, we were then, the next step was to get a complete uh, permission, and which was very difficult. The ICMR totally rejected our proposal saying that this cannot be done in a clinical setting. And ICMR, of course, is never known to promote anything which takes place in India as the first thing. They always want to, you to follow something which has been done in the West, nothing that is there as an originality. So we went to the our state government because health is a state issue. And to our biggest surprise, the, prime, the chief minister and the health minister were first to give us the ethical clearance. And therefore, we got a clearance after six months of struggle. We learned a great number of lessons tackling these problems. And these problems, every problem that came, we tried to tackle. And we thought that there should be a solution. And this led us to the success. The biggest question people kept on asking me, even my colleagues asked me, why do you want to do uterine transplant? The unanswered problems of AUFI, absolute uterine factor infertility, in 1978, when the IVF came, it addressed the problems of the tubes and the ovaries. What happens to the women who are either not born with the uterus or a uterus is not enough to carry the pregnancy? Only two options were there, adoption and surrogacy. So AUFI, which is the absolute uterine factor infertility, consists of either congenital, which is MRK syndrome, non-functional anatomical uterus, uterine malformations, or in those people where hysterectomy has been done as an emergency or for cervical cancer or rupture of the uterus. In our own country, when we looked at the data, one out of 5,000 females are developed are MRK female. So we were looking at something like 1,29,000 females per year in India. What were the problem, problems with adoption? I don't want to go into this, but all of you know that getting an adoption in India is not easy. It's a psychological issue, and a lot of people do face problems if financially the, the entire uh, the family is not very supportive. Problems with surrogacy, I will not go into the details. Again, there is a surrogacy law which has been passed. Everybody knew about these problems, and recently a surrogacy law has been formed. So why uterine transplant? So uterine transplant is an answer to complete motherhood. When you do adoption, there is legal motherhood. When you do surrogacy, there is genetic motherhood. When you do uterine transplant, there is legal, genetic, and biological motherhood, a wholesome experience of being a mother. Those people who cannot have or cannot become mother do not have menses from the day of first day of their birth as a female. The, the, the sadness, the disappointment is there to see on their face. It can be also done in transgenders, which was one of the reasons which was first done. The first uterine transplant in the world was done in 1936 in Germany. And there is a movie, which is an Oscar winning movie called as the Danish girl. So uterine transplant was done on a transgender. When did this part takes place? Did this happen overnight? No. I went to AAGL and I heard the first uh, talk by Mark Brainstrom, who was the first person to deliver a live childbirth after the uterine transplant. It was a great lecture. All of us gave him standing ovation. But there were few like me who kept on asking why only uterine vessels were used? Why couldn't we use ovarian vessels? Because after a trachelectomy, my patients were becoming pregnant. Why 14 hours were required to take out the uterus of a mother? Why put patient through 14 hours of anesthesia? And the biggest question being a laparoscopic surgeon, the things that came to my mind, can it be done laparoscopically? And of course, can it be done in India? These were the thoughts and this made me very, very restless. This was in 2014 when the first baby was born out of uterine transplant. We, did we do the transplant immediately? No. In spite of doing more than 1,000 radical hysterectomies and anterior excitation, I thought we should prepare ourselves for the anatomy. 
So I went back to the cadaveric lab. Unfortunately, the cadaveric lab is own, was existing only in Ramaya at that point of time. So I had to travel to Germany and Turkey. I used to be with the cadaver for six, six, seven, seven hours trying to understand the vascular anatomy. Then every uterus which was removed out of the radical hysterectomy, we tried to cannulate the uterine artery and try to see whether the flow of the uh, entire methylene blue was coming through the ovarian veins and whether one uterine artery or the internal iliac artery would be sufficient to understand the entire thing. And we decided that the first transplant we do, we will use the internal iliac artery, the internal iliac vein, and of course, we will also use the ovarian vein. So total amount of six anastomoses, three on each side will be done. We will not use the uterine artery, uh, ovarian artery, because it is too small. The first time when we decided that we will harvest the uterus laparoscopically, we found out that we could achieve about nine centimeters of length of the uterine artery and 11 centimeters of the ovarian vein, long enough to reach the external iliac artery and the vein which are required in the recipient. And this is a video. So we did the first world's first laparoscopic retrieval of the uterus. And this was done on a 3D laparoscope. We were planning to do it robotically, but then we thought that it is better to do it laparoscopically. And this is a little bit of glimpse of what we did. The difference between doing a hysterectomy in a normal patient and the hysterectomy which is done from the donor is that the vessels have to be taken the last. So you can see this is the superior vesicle artery. This is the uterine artery. And the trick lies in the fact that every small vessel from the uterine artery, which goes towards the bladder and the rectum, has to be taken and clipped because when revascularization takes place, there will be bleeding. To our biggest surprise, we realized that what was written in Gray's Anatomy, that there are about two to three branches of the uterine artery, we found there were at least eight branches of the uterine artery. So each and every branch is taken. You cannot ligate the internal iliac artery or the uterine artery till the uterus is completely separated out. So you can see this is the ureter lower down. The uterine artery is not at all touched. It has to be with a non-touch technique because that's the vessel which is going to prevent any kind of rejection. And all these vessels are taken and you can see the ureter being separated completely. That is the superior vesicle artery. We went into the paravesicle space. And then you can see that the entire uterine artery going up to the uterus was well preserved. That's the ureter. The ureter in the meantime gets little amount of devascularized, but it can be easily separated because the ureter carries its own mesentery. The next step was to do a colpotomy. So when we did colpotomy, we realized that the cervicovesicle fascia, the veins lie underneath the cervicovesicle fascia. And if we do a colpotomy without ligating the uterine artery and the vein, it's going to bleed. So we took some sutures and then not only did we take the sutures, but we also joined the cervicovesicle fascia and the denonvillous fascia with a bath suture so that when revascularization takes place, there cannot be an excessive bleeding which can take place from the vagina. Then you can see the internal iliac artery distal to the origin of the uterine artery was cut and the uterine artery was further separated. The uterine vein was first and now the specimen is ready to be taken out. We clipped only on the body side, no clip on the, on the graft side. And now this is, you can see the anterior division of the internal iliac artery being clipped and similarly the ovarian vein being clipped. And then within this is called as the warm ischemia time. And then we could see, and we took out the entire specimen exactly after clipping in less than two and a half minutes. The graft was then brought on a block of ice with a custodial solution, similar way in which you do a kidney transplant and the vessels were dissected off. So this is the uterine internal iliac artery, which is dissected off. The time which is required for a cold ischemia time is about 45 minutes to one hour. So you cannot take more than 45 minutes to one hour. This is the ovarian vein, which we cannulated. 
Then we also cannulated the internal iliac artery. You can see the length of pedicles over there. This was a team of plastic and vascular surgeons who saw that there is no leak from any of the vessels because once the revascularization takes place, it's going to be directly coming from the external iliac artery and it would lead to a lot of bleeding. So this was, re this was cannulated and a custodial solution was put and under the, uh, we make, made sure that the uterus temperature goes down to minus 18 degrees so that we can get more time to do this. In the meantime, another team, which was headed by Dr. Nita Verti, prepared the recipient bed, that too laparoscopically. And then the uterus was bought with a block of ice. You can see the block of ice over there. And first the outflow channel, that is the internal iliac vein, uh, was joined to the external iliac vein in an end to side fashion with a 7O proline Fairly simple job. It was right in front of that because this patient's BMI was just about 20, thin patient, and this is what we had selected. Once this was done, then the internal iliac artery was joined to the external iliac artery in an end-to-side fashion, again with a 7O proline. The diameter of this is about 6 to 6.5 millimeters, which is very, very small and a little bit larger than the coronary but always a vascular surgeon is better than the cardiac surgeon. And therefore we used a vascular surgeon. And once, once anastomosis was complete, just with one anastomosis, you can see the uterus completely pink. The rest of the anastomosis were done later. First thing we, we started the blood flow to the uterus and this, then the uterus was joined to the vagina lower part. And of course, we also made sure that there is no prolapse. So we used a proline suture from the uterosacral, which was harvested from the donor to the sacral promontory, and we fixed the uterus. Mind you, the space here is very less because these, was, these women are born without the uteruses. And then we finished rest of the anastomosis in a similar manner. You can see the color of the uterus, nice and pink. The entire job was done in less than two hours. And this was how the uterine transplant was done for the first time. You can see the length of pedicles which was achieved by open surgery versus the laparoscopic surgery. You can see the length of pedicles that we achieved were more or less the same or rather more with this. Did we match something which was done in Sweden? Of course, yes. Our duration went to only eight to 10 hours, which was the total time taken for the entire transplant. The duration for donor was four hours. The duration for recipient was four hours. Total ischemia time was 45 minutes. That is the cold ischemia time. Blood loss was hardly anything. Outcome was successful. The lady had our first menses on 48 days after the transplant, which was more or less similar. In the meantime, what we realize is that when you do an internal iliac vein, this is, there is no operation in the world which involves the removal of the internal iliac vein. To master the anatomy of internal iliac vein, whether it is excentration or anything, is not easy. So the question that came to my mind was, can we get away with the internal iliac vein? You can see the internal iliac vein there. And then, can we get away and do the innovation by using just the ovarian vein because our patients were becoming pregnant after trachelectomy also? So we demonstrated the utero-ovarian anastomosis. We went back to our radical hysterectomy specimens. We used the methylene blue dye. We injected through the uterine artery. And to our greatest surprise, the entire methylene blue completely colored the uterus with just one uterine artery. And the entire specimen looked blue. And we realized that the entire uh, uterus can survive just with one uterine artery and the vein. So this is how we did and demonstrated this in the clinical setting. And then, of course, in the next surgery that we did, we realized that we can use just the uterine artery. This is actual graft taken out of the mother, that is from the donor. This is the length of the uterine artery. We dispensed off with the uterine vein. We just use ovarian vein, making the procedure simpler duplicable because uterine artery and uterine vein can be easily done by a fairly good gynecologist and a gyne oncologist while taking an internal iliac vein is a tedious task. You can see the number of clips and there you can see that we cannulated that and whatever we cannulated from there, everything started coming out through the ovarian vein, indicating the utero-ovarian anastomosis is good enough to do this kind of job. 
So this is the internal iliac artery, and this is the ovarian vein. The ovarian artery is very small, while the ovarian veins are very big. And this is the utero-ovarian anastomosis that you can easily see over there. Abandon one side of ovarian vein and artery, but we did not use one uterine artery and one ovarian vein. We just thought that it is sufficient, but we always use both the uterine arteries and both the ovarian vein. What was the advantages of abandoning uterine vein? No traction on the lower segment, easy suturing of the back and rods ligament, and least morbid procedure. This procedure, of course, leads to complete devascularization of the ureters. And in the few cases that were done before us, they reported ureteric fistulas. So we made sure that none of our patients get ureteric fistulas. We used the omental wrapping and a double J stent, and we did not have any fistulas along this ureters. And this was very, very important. The, another thing that we did was a cervical vesicle fascia innovation. As I showed you, we realized that when the revascularization took place in the previous transplant, they, you had to use blood transfusion because the bleeding took place from the vaginal end. These are the veins you are cutting. And when the direct flow comes from the external iliac vein and the artery, there is bleeding. So we use a barb suture to use the denominalis fascia and the cervicovesical fascia to join to one another. And this was our evol evolution. The next evolution that we realized was that we had the uterine artery, instead of what was described in the entire literature, had eight to nine branches. These were the eight to nine branches which had to be clipped very meticulously. And this is what we realized during our entire uh, uh, journey towards the transplant. And it was the key to doing a good transplant because you had to make sure that there is no bleeding from any of this area once the revascularization takes place. This is our publication, which is now accepted, uh, understanding the gamut of uterine artery after the uterine transplant. How did we monitor these patients post-operatively? When the liver, kidney, you can monitor very easily. The LFTs, the liver function test can go haywire. The kidney may not bring out urine, but how do you monitor the uterine transplant? So we did routine blood investigation. Non-invasive way was to use a Doppler study to find out whether the blood flow was correct. And the second thing that we did was we did a biopsy of the cervix using hysteroscopy without any kind of medium. And these biopsies were sent for C4D immunome markers, and we found that there was no rejection. So we did those biopsies on the 7th day, 14th day, and of course on the 21st day, and Doppler almost alternate day. We also used the same kind of precautions which were used for any transplant. HEPA barriers were conducted, isolation rooms were there, barrier nursing was done, and the patients had the same immunosuppressive protocol like the methylprednisolone, tacrolimus, macrofilament mofetil, and plasma pheresis was done prior to this doing this transplant. Except when we wanted to convert this into pregnancy, we replaced the MMF, that is the mycophilnet mofetil, with azathioprine because that is supposed to cause a teratogenic effect. Tacrolimus levels were always done and maintained between 5 to 10 nanogram as compared to liver as well as the kidney where you can keep the tacrolimus levels on the lower side and cyclophosphamide was never used. Fortunately, all our recipients have started menstruating. What was the IVF procedure which was done? Most important thing is that you need to do an in vitro fertilization before the transplant. So ovaries are very higher up in MR cage. Anatomy is distorted. Vagina is almost very small. So it was not an easy thing for our IBS specialists to pick up the oocytes. These are the Doppler images and the videos of the vessels. After a transplant, you can see the uterus very nice. All the blood flow very, very nice over there. So difficulty in embryo transfer is also there because after improper vaginoplasty, even if you put the uterus there, the transfers are not very, very easy. So when we did the transabdominal uh, embryo transfer in one of the patients, we also did a trans uh, cervical or a myometrial embryo transfer. You can see that. So these were another additional innovations that we did when we wanted to do the embryo transfer. The challenges... I'm not going to go into the details of IVF. I'm not an expert. Which protocol to be used? There will be a poor quality of embryos. And all these were there. And these were overcome. In the first person who became pregnant, we, did, we could do the transfer through the transvaginal route. And we could place the embryo. 
This patient, after the first transfer, aborted, and there were no signs of abortion because we have only transplanted the vessels. We have not transplanted the nurse, so it was a painless abortion. There were two abortions before the third time she became pregnant. These are the number of uh, uh, number of transplants that we have done, and you can see that everybody had almost between four to eight embryos which were ready to go. We did the removal of the uterus after the first baby was about one year because the patient cannot be on immunosuppression lifelong. We didn't want to take a second chance, though the second child is allowed by the Montreal Declaration, but we were not ready. So this is a video to show after the baby was one year, we decided to take out the uterus because the lady was going a little fatter with prednisolone and steroids and tacrolimus. So we decided to take out the uterus and this was also done laparoscopically. Look at the size of the uterus, but what was the, our biggest surprise was when we used this, there was a pseudo aneurysm which was formed. You can see that pseudo aneurysm formed between the vessels which were joined to the external iliac vein and the artery. So this was a kind of pseudo aneurysm. A novice would have thought that it is a tube, but it was a pseudo aneurysm. We could take a good stitch and control the pseudo aneurysm. And we did a hysterectomy after doing this. So this was also done laparoscopically. We had one complication after a transplant. One of the ladies after a transplant had about the uterus, which was completely going on the top. And it went up because the vagina was small. So we brought back the entire uterus back into the vagina. And that too, we did it laparoscopically. Because it went higher up, we could not feel the cervix. We again went in laparoscopically. And because of the skills that we have, we could again take the uterus back into the vagina. So these were quite few lessons that we learned over a period of time. What happened to the pregnancy? During the first trimester, as I said, both the patients, one of the patients who's already delivered and one of the patients who's now pregnant had abortions. They were spontaneous abortions and they were absolutely painless abortions. But once the first trimester hurdle was gone, the second hurdle that we had to face, whether the lady baby will have a chromosomal anomalies. So we did a anomaly scan. And in the third trimester, we always anticipated PIH and diabetes and of course, intrauterine death. So despite the constant risk of teratogenic immunosuppression, the anomaly scans were normal. We did not have to do any amniocentesis, which was told to us by the fetal uh, medicine specialist, but anomaly scans were completely normal. We did the delivery at 32 weeks because this is a uterus of the mother. It cannot go up to 40 weeks. It cannot enlarge to such a large size. And at about 30 to 32 weeks, you will find the patient developing preeclampsia and amniotic score was also going on the lower side. And this was the reason we decided to deliver her on the 32 weeks. And that time we thought that we'll have to do cesarean hysterectomy, but the patient's uterus responded to oxytocin and carbofrost, and we did not have to do. So data analysis, now after doing the transplant, we have around MRKH patient 226, 26 hysterectomies, 24 obstetric hysterectomy, androgen sensitivity, two turners, and one usherman. These are the number of patients waiting for transplant at our institute. So much was the rush that we have seen more than 1,500 patients who want to do a transplant that we had to start a specialized OPD during this time. And why are we so proud? What, what have we done something different from the world? So the first University of Gothenburg for Sweden who did, had the first baby after the transplant out of the first nine transplant, the first four were failures. Even at Baylor University, three which were done earlier were absolute failures. And all of them were because of fungal infections. The rejections were because of fungal infection. Everybody thought in a country like India, what would we do? We would also have the same thing because this is an organ which is projecting outside the abdominal cavity with a very, very high risk of infection. None of the transplanted organs are exposed to the atmosphere, which is only uterus is exposed to the atmosphere. Even at Cleveland Clinic in uh, Ohio, they had the first two transplant that failed because of fungal infection and they were taken as emergency because there was a disruption of anastomosis. We are proud here to say that as a country, as an institute, the first six transplants that we have done, none of the patients had any mobility. All of them were successful. All of them are menstruating. And of course, we had a success with this. 
out of the 12 countries which are performing uterine transplant globally india now proudly stands there with the flag that we are also one of the part which is done this was the recent study published in 2019 and yesterday only another uh, study has been published which has mentioned our uh, uterine transplant with a living donor by laparoscopic donor surgery so much is the interest which is generated that the time magazine has now come out with an issue the future of babies gene editing uterine transplant three biological parents so all this is important this is a publication which has recently come in which shows that the donor was a patient's 44 year mother and successful childbirth took place at galaxy did we stop here no because this was laparoscopy and coming from india the acceptance would have been not been very easy the people world wouldn't have believed us so we published laparoscopic assisted uterine retrieval from live organ donor for the first time in the world it was done the donor did not have an incision this was the biggest thing and then of course our contribution was a surgical technique using utero ovarian anastomosis and when i sent this for publication in the top journal that is the jamic journal it was accepted in 7 days and they said that we this is going to make a difference because now this procedure becomes duplicable and which is what we want today it's not should not be for elite few surgeons doing this kind of surgery our success was celebrated right after the agl that is the american association of global congress for the first time when took place on the 7th of november 2018 we had the baby on 18th october changed the program to have the opening ceremony but with this we jump straight to the future and this is the last the last step of our evolution but for the moment because uh, evolution is temporary because always changes In 2017 my very good friend Shailesh Putambeker translated this creative surgery under the eye of laparoscopic approach and so the first uterine transplant with the laparoscopic approach the minimal invasive procedure proposed by Harry Rich in the 80s was performed this is the further evolution the 18 of october so few days ago the first baby was born from a laparoscopic so we not only did the first laparoscopic retrieval of the donor we were planning to do even laparoscopic vascular anastomosis as it done in kidney transplant we trained ourselves before covid in 2019 going on the cadaver unfortunately because of the covid the government is not giving permission for a non vital organ transplant in the last 2 years because they feel this is a non vital organ transplant there are ladies waiting for that so i just stand here as a captain of this team i remain indebted to these people who believed in me when there was nothing they didn't even know whether there will be light at the end of tunnel they believed in me in a leader in this today's era how many doctors without any expectation of money all the six transplants have been done free not a single rupee has been charged to the patient how many people would believe and do this in today's era so i stand here i make a very sincere effort and tell you that it is only because of this that i can do and therefore i am seeing standing at the back of them because i pushed them i did not lead them that is the most important difference between a leader so this is what important lessons that we learn uterine transplant is a complete answer to aufi single anastomosis is sufficient omental wrapping of the ureter will prevent any kind of fistulas laparoscopic assisted donor retrieval is good enough to bring you long pedicles and it is better vascularity most important thing the bottom line which is important for all of you to understand there is no morbidity there is no mortality the worst thing that can happen is a rejection of the uterus but there is no death there will never be a death regardless we supposed operative monitoring is required the fertility chances are the same like any ivf 40% chance of these uteruses bearing the pregnancy so do not expect 100% pregnancy none of them have been achieved in the world so far so it is not that once you have done a transplant and this is explained very well to this so the lessons we learned is creativity is thinking new things innovation is doing new things not not doing new things because you want to become famous one day a lot of effort energy and money has gone 
behind this work that we have done. And we are proud that at the end of the day, when we lie in our coffin, we will feel, oh, I should have done it. No, I'm proud to say I did it, irrespective of whatever hurdles that I face. And this is the pride with which I will go. So it was like achieving my mountain Everest, Everest, nobody can, everybody cannot go to Mount Everest because this is the highest peak, but you can have a Mount Everest in your career. This was my Mount Everest in my fertility enhancing surgery. And this is what was the biggest thing. What is the future? There is a bioengineered uterus, which is coming in. You must have watched about this. You may get surrogacy now in the lab because you will have a uterus and a surrogacy in the lab. And of course, uh, you know, the ladies will not be able to say that why you don't understand how much amount of pain I go through. Probably the males can also become mothers or fathers or whatever we know. With all our knowledge, the science days are not far. When men can experience, everything is theoretically impossible unless it is done. So the future is now the robotic assisted. We have, it has been done in Gothenburg after we did the laparoscopy but we are also in the process of doing it. In the last one and a half years, we are looking for the donors. Stores company was the only company which gave us some money about one year back. But when we do this, not only will we do the donor retrieval, but we will also do the recipient laparoscopically so that the lady will only have one caesarean section as an incision, which is the biggest opposition. So this is the future of uterine transplant. And thank you very much, Dr. Bandari. Thank you very much, Dr. Roma Singh, for being there in the evening and listening to what we have achieved in the last three years. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Puntambekar. I think it was a perfect 10 and a fantastic effort by you as a leader. And I do understand your uh, hard work and in saying that it's the team that always matters. Yes, it, it does. So I have heard this story from, as I told you, Nita, three years back. And it was good to hear from you as well. And knowing the nuances of uh, the surgical aspect of doing a, a uterine transplant. Um, I think we are going to take the questions in the end. I myself have a long list of questions. I've just noted the down, so I'm going to take the answers from you. Because as a surgeon, I had so many questions while you were explaining the surgical procedure. But uh, I think I'll just share a, a screen with a small presentation before we go in there. Um, if uh, you know, yeah. So uh, we all have heard the fantastic effort, uh, the surgical effort by Dr. Puntam Baker, and there is a no denying the fact that uh, this is here. So the question I've asked in my first slide is, are we there yet? Yes, we are. And I think Dr. Puntam Baker, by his presentation and his results, have shown that we are there with the uterine transplant already. The only question that we need to actually talk about, and I think some of it was covered by Dr. Pantambegar, is what is the clinical need? And these women who are born without uterus or lose the uterus or have a very damaged uterus, their options for motherhood today is only adoption and surrogacy. Yes, there are problems with adoption and surrogacy, but we must remember that they are still viable options, which as gynecologists or as infertility specialists, when we are dealing with these women, must be stressed upon and given to them that this could be an option because Although this is technically viable, it may not be possible for all women to fail this quality of life improving procedure, which we call it as a non-vital non organ transplant so quickly for all women. Now, specific requirements of trans recipient in such patients, I would suggest as a gynecologist that we, those, those women should be having functioning ovaries. Now, if you have women who don't have functioning ovaries, including women who have premature ovarian failure or absent ovaries will not be able to have that same pleasure of having a biological child in spite of going through a transplant. Uh, there has been discussion regarding not doing transplant in patients who don't have a functioning normal vagina with stratified epithelium because we all know the vaginal tissue or vaginal epithelium has its own protective mechanism in preventing uh, further problems and infections in a uterus. And so it will be true for a transplant uterus as well. So this will be one of my questions to Dr. Puntam Bega that in his series, how many patients had functioning normal vagina or what was his strategy when they did not have and they had to create a new vagina. And of course, I feel in today's scenario that we should offer this to only women who are in a stable marriage where after going with so much of trouble of having a transplant and bearing a child, they should have a stable family to be, take, to be able to take care of that child in future. Technological dateline, <clears throat> I think the first transplant was done in Saudi Arabia in 2000. 
that hysterectomy was done three months later due to rejection. And then, as he said, Bank, Max Bornstrom actually then worked on this and the first live birth in Sweden took place in about 2013 and which followed with which I think we started our journey in India with the transplant. But to the audience, uh, what I would like as a gynecologist in this particular forum to speak is that uterine transplant as Dr. Um, uh, Pundambekar fantastically showed us is only one part of the whole step in trying to give that woman the, woman, the motherhood that she is so desiring of. So we have to start from evaluation of the infertile couple. And of course, once, the, once we select them, an IVF or ICSI has to be done to have embryos created and freeze them. Then you need to see how the, if you have a donor, which is could be, usually are mothers who are very, very um, keen in giving and we should have a donor who has already had a reproductive history. We can't take one from who has never born a child. Donor surgery has to be done, recipient surgery, which was very well illustrated by Dr. Uh, Puntam Baker. Then of course, followed by the immune suppression therapy, follow for rejection management. Some of them may require a graft hysterectomy and just like any other transplant it can be very, very disappointing. Again, then followed by hormonal treatment before you do an embryo transfer. Advice to give only single embryo transfer and not multiple. And usual suggestion is to probably wait one year post transplant, transplant to do that. I'd again like the answer from Dr. Puntambegar, how much did they, this group waited before they did the embryo transfer. Of course, the antenatal care and management. Patient needs to have a cesarean section. One, as he said, most of them, but two is allowed. And of course, have a hysterectomy in the end. So in the 70 cases that have been reported till now of the transplant in a very recent article that I read in 2021, one fourth of them had graft failures, which required subsequent hysterectomy. And five complications in the recipients required further surgery intervention, which I think uh, a very expert surgeon like him has thought about it and taken care of the sacrovaginal fistula or a uretric fistula. Vaginal stenosis requiring dilatation and stenting was some of the other surgical interventions that these required. But we could, in a patient of transplant, especially in the uterine transplant, one can have possible complications in donors and recipients, so many. And if we go through the list, there are many, and I'm sure some of them, uh, Dr. Pandamikar in his surgical technique has already taken care of that they don't occur. So that's a lesson for all of the other budding surgeons looking to uh, foray in this area should take care of. What I want to just in few slides bring is the lethal, uh, the ethical and legal considerations of uterine transplant. Is it absolutely comparable with the issues of the ethical and legal considerations we have with surrogacy and adoption today? Probably not, because surrogacy adoption is of course a very, very age old method and uh, not much of legal problem if you go with the proper legal uh, system to adopt. Many children are available, many children are there who need a family who can be adopted. So that should be one of the most humane and compassionate thing that we could actually sometimes suggest or guide infertile couples to go ahead if they have a severe problem and not just with absolute uterine infertility for many other reasons. Surrogacy is a very, very viable option, is very good, but probably went into some bad light because of so many other things. And, and the recent surrogacy law that has probably almost come in India just said that either altruistic or family member should be surrogate. If that happens, then the commercial surrogacy goes away. It becomes difficult for people to access surrogacy. And then their option remains to have a uterine transplant if they are the right candidate. It's a pioneer research in this, in this field continues. We must be vigilant about how much harm is considered to be acceptable. We have had very good results with many of these centers and including our own center in India, which we are very proud of. But we must remember that there could be some harm, which can be either in the donor or in the recipient. Now, cadaver donor or diseased donor is probably the way to go in all kinds of transplant and solid organ transplant. But uterine transplant is a novel transplant. And then it requires, it is not an opt-out strategy. It requires express consent at the moment because there is no precedence that nobody can say that we have done this before, so you give a permission to take the uterus out also. And when we have a diseased donor, we have so many organs that are being harvested. Probably the harvesting of a non-vital organ like uterus may be the last in the list or may impact the multi-organ retrieval process. So these things have to be thought over, especially if we are looking in future to have our cadaver transplant program going on. And of course, in the living donor, we know that we have to understand and explain the risk of major surgery and its implications. 
the women with fertility the absolute uterine infertility the so called the recipient here in this case is a vulnerable population hoping to achieve pregnancy so what is their emotional aspects so there is emotion involved in this particular transplant let's not forget that any other transplant is a life saving measure it's a it's a matter of life or death here it's a matter of emotion and that is what we need to remember when we are undertaking a transplant of a non vital organ the charm of experiencing pregnancy and as he said that it was the first couple whom he felt bad we feel bad like as a gynecologist with many such young couples who come and we cannot help them and we feel that we should do all in our capacity to give them the charm of that experiencing pregnancy but it must be tempered by an honest consideration of what one can do and hydrogening harm if not done properly so predetermined safety monitors regulatory oversight can compromise and these are something i think i'm sure dr apuntam beger his group and the world and the groups world over are thinking in this direction and putting some regulatory um, aspects which could probably help refine this process much better so that more genuine patients who need it can be done this safely detailed informed counseling is probably nothing to be stressed upon here but regarding the risks and probably unknown risk because it's a novel therapy right now informed consent should probably include all techniques the risks the possible failures for the treatment the possibility of graft failure and and re subsequent requiring of hysterectomy even before an embryo transfer can be done can be very very disappointing and no guarantee and he said yes it is even if uh, ivf any reproductive surgery we always say there is no guarantee that you will achieve pregnancy we are only making a trying to make a difference so what does the medical community feel a recent survey amongst many uh, multiple specialties which were including obstetrics gynecology transplant surgeons transplant medicine 45% actually considered this procedure to be ethically justifiable which is quite encouraging and 36% introduce the concept with patients say that they will introduce this concept with patients who have absolute uterine so they agreed that they will talk about it and 22% said limited support only when surrogacy is prohibited so in only in those situation if surrogacy is not possible then we may consider and 10% a very small percentage disagreed and completely said that this should not be done at the moment but we have a long way to go and we have a small amount of a very small percentage of our medical fraternity who probably feels it should not be done so and but the rest 90 are still feeling that this is a this is a procedure which could probably change the future of reproductive medicine as we call it so need for long term outcomes following uterine transplant is really needed all cases i believe should be registered with international registry or national registry if we have one including the follow up of the donors recipients and how have these ops been this was the same thing that was very much um, stressed upon when the ivf really started and today we have such long term data that we don't have to even think twice before advising to our patients yes go for ivf it's it, it's it's quite okay and that's what we should have with the transplant also so how do we peep into the future we do understand point 1 there is technological feasibility we have seen with dr puntam bigger's presentation and results that once we get down to it the surgical feasibility is not a problem and managing the patient as a transplant patient is not a problem appropriate case selection and appropriate consent regulatory and legal authority should come into as he said it was difficult i don't know whether uh, we are working on some kind of uh, transplant uh, committee just like the committee that goes for i know for every kidney transplant one needs to go and take permission from a committee is that there here at present should be under clinical trial registry and follow up with donor recipient and reproductive outcomes of these women should be recorded for people to read and understand and analyze the results so it's time to move from clinical research protocol to clinical therapeutic application the time has to come in future it's only how we pursue this and i'm sure with a leader like dr puntam beger we will be achieving that and probably pro progressing in that area so i will stop my screen share with some of my thoughts here uh, i will uh, see if there are questions in the chat box otherwise i'll ask some questions to ruma i, I will like butt in Roma, yes, I'll butt in for a while yes, because I have somebody waiting for me. No uh, problem. And the outset, all I could say is congratulations, Dr. Kuntambekar, for a wonderful work you have done, and I feel really proud you have done proud to all of us. And 
God bless you and your future endeavors. Ruma has raised very particular questions and you are the reason for creating those questions. This is the way things grow in India. You take the child adoption aid, international child adoption aid, and no law was passed by parliament till there was a bishop of a child adopted in Germany and Supreme Court said that government has no time, we'll fix up the law for that. They created a committee. Same thing, our story is similar. When Ruma's husband was with me in Sanjay Gandhi, we did the first kid, Cadbury kidney transplant. We began a program with the Cadbury kidney transplant with no Cadbury law. We took the same thing. We involved the state government, took their permission, took a kidney and transplanted. And there the whole cascade of events of parliament passing the bill. So I think the beginning has been made and it was such a pleasure to listen to you as a surgeon, as a, as a very keen observer of uh, bioethics for the transplantation and uh, look forward to see you sometime in action in Pune. Thank you very much for sparing your Thank time. You. And I am sure like me, everybody enjoyed. And Ruma, you really put the icing on the cake and I leave both of you for a debate for the benefit of people. So thank you very much and I would like to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to have you with us in the evening. Uh, okay, I have my job cut out here to ask some questions from the audience. Dr. Pantambeka, the first question from the audience is what about the total cost in India? I think you addressed this a little and said that you are not. Uh, could you answer that question? I, we, were, we have done the first ones uh, uh, totally free, but now it's not possible. So we are now uh, planning to charge around uh, 12 to 15 lakh rupees per uh, transplant. Okay. And once the, the question is over, then I'll address two of the things which are majorly raised by you, but let the questions be over. No okay. Question. The second question is, sir, can we have normal uh, natural fertilization by physical contact or can it be IVF only? Can it be only by IVF after? Um, and they're just wanting to know whether they can have spontaneous uh, conception. They cannot have spontaneous because we do not transplant the tubes. We just transplant the uterus. So no spontaneous uh, fertilization. It has to be an embryo transfer. And uh, these are the two major issues. So we have to get the embryos done before we go ahead with the transplant. Would you like to comment or would yeah, you like I to will, ask some I will, questions? I will just, uh, clarify three, four things which are very sure, important. Go ahead, go ahead, sir. I'll one, ask you one some questions. One of the most important thing is uh, uterine transplant because of our effort has been registered with NOTO, that is the National Organ Transplant, which, was, which has taken two years for us to... Uh, get this across into SOTO, that is the state transplant organization, and now in NOTO. So no longer can it be considered as an experimental thing. They have noticed it, they have monitored our results, and every patient that we operate has to be uh, shown to them like a kidney transplant. Kidney transplant. Okay. Every transplant that we do is doesn't come with a blanket permission. We have to go to the government hospital, and case by case it is decided. The same way a live kidney transplant and liver transplants are done. So the regulatory authorities are already there. And this was surely done because of our efforts, because we knew there will be people who will be asking questions. That's the reason we have used only the mothers. And in fact, first time we were also taken to the court and we were asked, why is it that you, are, uh, you do not have a MCH degree or according to the organ transplant uh, law, why is it that you are not been trained for one year? Because till that time, only 10 transplants were done. So when, they, when the lawyer looked at the entire law, they realized that the law is for abdominal and thoracic organ. And Gray's anatomy and Frank Nater anatomy classifies uterus as pelvic organ. So the judge said, this is correct. Make law for pelvic organ. Till that time, this is okay. So we have faced our shares of legal battles because anything that is new is not accepted. In fact, unfortunately, the maximum amount of opposition came from the doctors when we started doing it. I did not get a single patient from IVF units, though we have multiples of them in India because they thought that I'm intruding into their territory. But right now I really don't need them because I have myself, I have 400 patients waiting. So this is one. And we go according to the Montreal criteria 
So Montreal criteria says that the marriage has to be stable and there has to be marriage certificate. We have only created the protocol. Only mothers we are using. The government is asking us to use uh, non-related donors because a lot of hysterectomies are done anyway. These uteruses can be used for your donors, but we are refusing to do this. They are after us that you create a uterus uh, bank, but we are not interested in doing all this because this will open a long queue of illegalities which will come into the areas. So we are very, very sure about what we are doing. We knew our hassles. We knew our hurdles. We knew that we will be taken to the court. Everything that we anticipated took place. We have sailed through. And just to put you, the entire thing is any new thing that comes into the area, if there was no transplant, we wouldn't be here debating. So Correct. every technology has to start with some kind of transplant. There has to be an opposition. I have been coaxing a lot of centers to start the transplant because it is like me running in the race. When I am first, I am second, I am third, I am fourth. So they, you have to have the, gather the team. This is what happened when I did radical hysterectomy for the first time. People said, oh, why laparoscopic open surgery is better? So it doesn't matter, but I am very happy that the debates are taking place because only through the debates can you get the correct rules. When you get opposition, science will progress more rather than appreciation. So yes, it has to be opposed to the nails. The thinner points have to be detailed and the discuss so that some of the crooks who exist in our uh, profession also do not take an advantage. What we have done sincerely may not be done equally sincerely. This has happened in kidney transplant. This has happened in liver transplant. We are very careful. Though we have so much of waiting, we are not doing one or two transplant more than that one year. So we are trying to cover up. Of course, we are not perfect. More debate should take place. We will be streamlining this. The protocols have been shared with NOTO. So anybody wants to start, the protocols are already in place. Everything has been given. We have been open book. Before 2018, when I shared my laparoscopic video on the net, you will be surprised to know not a single center was ready to tell us the technique of uterine transplant. We went from pillar to post, from Baylor to Cleveland to Gothenburg. They said, no way we will tell you how we did it. That was the word. So they were just telling us technical details were not given, videos were not shared. I was the first person to share the video. So this much is our transparency. We had done it with a very big honesty and integrity, and we hope to continue to do this. But of course, only time will tell whether this will stand the entire time. Maybe this will be just a technological wonder. Maybe people will stop doing it. Maybe more people will start doing it. Too early to say, but yes, well, we have shown that this is possible. Now let's debate it over the period of years. So yeah. thank you very much for raising all the questions. And I'm glad that you raised the questions because this yeah. is something which I'm very happy to answer. I've traveled the world showing that there have been appreciations, there have been ethical issues, and it is always good to face them because you don't do anything I've, ethical. I brought this because uh, whenever there is a discussion, these are the common things that people discuss and say, it's not going to work. So I said, I must hear it right from you. And that's the reason yeah. why I raised it. And so they should be raised it. anyway. Yes, the they idea, be raised. Yeah, the idea of the state government saying so many hysterectomies happen, so you should use it. Are they diseased uterus? You can't transplant them for a pregnancy. So I don't know why, yeah. what is that thought process there. There is, it's a thought process of the bureaucrats. Those are the same bureaucrats who I told know. me I initially know that you cannot do it because unless something is done in Delhi or Mumbai, Pune is such a small place. I mean, this is the kind of thinking that people have. So you don't have to worry about them. You have to just answer them with cool mind. I've gone through this. So nothing, okay. no Ukraine bank, no unrelated donor so far. Okay. So uh, one more question has come up from the chat box. Sir, as you have said, we don't transplant tube. Can you tell us, can you tell us no a little bit what is main culprit? Why not to transport fallopian tube and ovary? Very good question. The answer to this is very simple. The tubes uh, function because of the neurogenic signals which go to the tubes. The peristalsis doesn't take place on its own. Uterus is the only organ which responds to the hormones coming from the ovary. But the tubes have to pick up the ovum. This doesn't happen. And invariably, the first part, when we put the transplant, there is a shedding of the endometrium. This leads to osteal closure. 
so that is the first thing that takes place that's a natural response of the uterus which we have seen on hysteroscopy so nowhere in the world do the tubes can be relied upon and the blood supply to the tubes is unpredicted the viability of the tubes is unpredicted in not only in the dogs and the sheep where it has been carried out nowhere so it's not because the nerves are not transplanted and transferring embryo is not a difficult job so it's a part of ivf we have our ivf people who are supporting us otherwise as a cancer surgeon i hardly knew about what is first trimester and second trimester i have now become a good expert in amniotic fluid index and what is pih and everything so you are following all these antenatal patients very closely i suppose so okay. yeah i know technical, technical questions from me uh, we will start with the two so what do you do you do a salpingectomy in the donor we do a salpingectomy uh, we do a salpingectomy we do a salpingectomy Always, okay. always. So, so in the donor hysterectomy, when you are doing, what is the length of the uterine cuff, uh, vaginal cuff that you take? Because you need to About take a certain. Two, not more than two centimeters, because okay. the lower part of the vagina is supplied by the pudendal Again, vessels. Supplied, that I know. We have yeah. studied, so we cannot rely on the uterine vessels to supply the vagina. So we don't take more than two centimeters. And how many of these cases that you have done did not have a vagina? I mean, you had five a new patients, vagina. Five patients had MRKH, and their vaginoplasty was already done, and those vaginoplasties were peritoneal vaginoplasties, so they have okay. survived. It is not the epithelial. That is not the criteria worldwide. The only mm -hmm. criteria are like who should be the donor, who should be the recipient, and we have not used any ovum donations so far. Everything. So all of them had their own ovaries and functioning ovaries. Their own ovaries, and all of them fortunately had mothers who were either menstruating or immediate postmenopausal, so we could use them. Okay, one interesting fact you mentioned about uh, suturing the McEnroe's and Denovillus fascia that was done on the bench surgery, I suppose. Yeah. On the bench, right? Okay. All right. Okay, and uh, the the uh, cesarean section that was done classical by choice. classical by choice because you because. cannot go to the because the I bladder understand. goes and sticks there so cannot do otherwise and fantastic uh, laparoscopic picture of the post delivery <laughs> strictly and that aneurysm i'm sure somebody would have got confused and <laughs> yeah, had yeah, a yeah. major problem so that's good uh, i think you have covered most of it i had some questions all right uh, one quick question you mentioned the first case that you the, the patient that delivered with you Was the one with the Asherman syndrome or with Amerikich? No, with Asherman. One who syndrome. delivered in eighteen. Asherman. 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 So that was the other, other other one which is pregnant is Amerikich. Great. I think it is great. If there are no more questions, we can probably uh, close the session. Doctor Bandari has left yeah. for some, so I would uh, wholeheartedly thank you. Thank you Myself, very much. On behalf of Vatikuti uh, Foundation and all the audience who have actually glued with us and are all staying till the end to hear uh, all the fantastic things that you have to share with us, uh, it's a real pleasure. And uh, I hope I'll meet you. In fact, I'm there in Pune the next weekend for Sunita's workshop. So if you are there, probably will. Uh, I'm, I'm also there as a faculty, but I will not be there. I have to go to US for the AGL. Uh, I'm the scientific committee chairman there. So next year's entire scientific committee meeting is they want it in person. You have person, to go all the so way I to US to attend that. Yeah, yeah, oh, they are. Again, again, I missed you. Nine and lectures are there, so they, we have to take care of them. Right. No problem. So we'll wait. I'll see you sometime. Okay. Of course. Bye bye. Good night. Bye. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.